It's my great pleasure to introduce Alex Graves uh, for today's application talk. Alex received his PhD from CMU, and he's currently an associate professor at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, he has won a number of awards, uh, including the NSF Career Award and he a number of Best Paper Awards. Uh, I could actually go on and on about the number of cool things that Alex does, but uh, uh, I think I'll let him speak. And he's talking about some really exciting application today, sort of really fits in with the spirit of the application talks we have been having at NLSS. He works with uh, large amounts of data from astronomy, from astronomers, and tries to figure out how to scale up machine learning algorithms to work with basically astronomical data. So, there you are. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Vishy. All right, it's great to be here. I know you're all tired, but uh, I have pretty pictures to keep you awake. So, um, first credit, these are the people who do the hard work I'm going to talk about. This is my lab, and uh, we're an interdisciplinary group. A lot of math and computer science backgrounds, and I have a research scientist who's a physicist. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about things in sevens, just because it happened to turn out that way. Seven problems in astronomy, seven tasks of machine learning that we'll end up wanting to think about, and then um, that will lead to computational blockages uh, when we try to do state-of-the-art machine learning on really large data sets. And so we'll think about what sorts of computational bottlenecks there are when you try to speed up all of machine learning. And then the main thing I want to talk about is seven general strategies for dealing with big data, I'm trying to do machine learning on big data. OK, um, so first. <coughs> Astronomy, astrophysics. What's astronomy? Astronomy is observing the stuff that's out there. The terms are a little uh, interchangeable sometimes. Astrophysics technically is the theory. Not, there's the observing of the stuff, which is its own art to do with telescopes. And, and, um, and these days, telescopes aren't just um, like the one you're thinking of. A long tube, <laughs> they're fancy you know, uh, instruments for all different wavelengths. Um, then there's the actual theory of what the stuff is and how it came to be, and that's astrophysics. So, um, and then a sub part of astrophysics is cosmology, and that's actually the area that I work in and my collaborators work in, and that's. Um, really asking, it, uh, to me, one of the most basic questions of science, which is, where did everything come from? What is the origin of the universe exactly? And that's more or less Big Bang theory. And um, it it's very connected to the foundations of all of physics. So it gets into stuff that the parts of fundamental physics that you can only study on a large scale, the largest of scales, which is the cosmic scale. Relativity and um, other forces, potentially, which we'll get to that are on that scale. Can everybody hear me in the back? OK. OK, and then so sometimes this is called large scale structure. And we're only, we're able to, we're in a recently, meaning last 10 years or, or less, we're in a regime of astronomy where we actually have pictures of the entire sky all in one data set. And this is relatively recent. So we can um, really start to ask questions about the most um, fundamental physics on that scale now that we can observe on that scale. <coughs> OK. Um, and then what's astrostatistics? Well, it's sort of like. Um, biostatistics or, or whatever. It's the statistics of astronomy, astrophysics. How old is it? It's actually pretty old. Of 
course, you could argue that Gauss was the father, <laughs> was the father of everything. He did um, astrostatistics. But in a way, machine learning sophistication is only starting to happen um, relatively recently. And then just as there's bioinformatics, you can talk about astroinformatics. And that would be statistics and informatics, meaning everything from IT to computer science algorithms, the computer part of, of that field. And that's relatively new, at least as a field. OK. Um, so really, it's cosmology that we're talking about. And to me, I'm very biased. But that's the coolest part of the whole thing. Where does everything come from? So I've been doing this for a while. My first job was at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, laboratory which is part of NASA. And back then, the world's biggest sky survey. Sky survey means you have a telescope that is really trying to take a large sample of the whole universe. It moves, takes pictures of the whole sky, or a bunch of the sky, as much as you can. Back then, it was called the Digital Palomar Observatory Sky Survey, the biggest one. Um, <coughs> it worked on a bunch of things. And then um, that was superseded. So this is a continuing process. There are many surveys, actually. Um, but there's a, sort of usually one granddaddy at any given time, which is the biggest. So um, right now, it's the it's still the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. How big are these things? This thing is now, um, we're at about half a billion points, objects. <clears throat> and that's about to be superseded, of course. And it's exponential growth, generally. And that exponent in the growth of data sizes is a larger exponent than the growth in computer speeds. So no, you can't just wait for Moore's law. So um, it's actually how things work in astronomy. You can't just grab data and work with it. And it's, this is the case in all of science generally, um, where the data is hard to come by. And so whoever went through all the effort to collect that data create the instruments and all that. They have the right to work on that for a while exclusively. And then they can open it up. They will open it up to the public. Um, but so if you want to work on the latest, freshest data uh, in general in science, in particular in astronomy, you have to be part of an official member of the collaboration. And so luckily, I'm an official member. I believe I'm the only machine learning type who's an official member of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So um, <clears throat> here's some, here are two sort of, this will give you a flavor of the kinds of uh, stuff that, that I think is cool that you can do in astronomy. So um, you may or may not remember there are four fundamental forces that we think are in the universe. Um, well, recently, people are thinking um, there might be a fifth one. And if that's true, that's the biggest change in physics, basic physics, since Einstein, which is 100 years ago. OK, so uh, we don't have a name for it yet because we don't really understand it. But there's mounting evidence for it. Um, they just call it dark energy. Dark just means we can't observe it directly sort of like dark matter. We think that there's this other matter out there, but we can't observe it directly. So we just call it dark. Okay, um, so there's a lot of confusion and controversy around dark energy. Once it's completely verified and, and there's a theory for it, that will certainly be a Nobel Prize. The first piece of evidence for it had to do with some obscure um, anomalous observation to do with supernovae. Arguably, the second, or, or at least the, the biggest large-scale evidence for dark energy was this 
study that was um, cited as the top scientific breakthrough of 2003. So science, the journal, lists every year 10 scientific breakthroughs, the top 10. And this was number one. They were picked for number one. And it was a validation for, of dark energy. But it's very controversial. So one man's validation is another man's you know, uh, BS. So, um, and that's because uh, it gets into very subtle issues of uh, hypothesis testing, which, which I'll, I'll come to a, a little bit later. So um, <clears throat> this was uh, past the hypothesis test, two sigma accuracy. Okay, but uh, physicists want to see something like six sigma before they're completely satisfied. Okay, um, <clears throat> and the, one of the linchpins of this was a fast algorithm, the first fast algorithm for, that allowed the computation of a certain spatial statistic that is um, kind of central in all of cosmology. And we did, in fact, it, we published it first in NIPS, believe it or not. So that's one thing. So um, another thing, uh, so Einstein's relativity predicted a bunch of things. And one of the things it predicts is something called cosmic magnification, which is that light from very far away, from the farthest away objects, appears um, magnified due to stuff that's closer to you because, um, uh, because of bending by gravity. Okay, but um, that was just a prediction until uh, we could do the right statistical analysis. You could only do it on a large scale with a fast enough algorithm. And so we supplied that algorithm. And it has to do with finding quasars, which I'll mention. Okay, so uh, these are the kinds of things that uh, I try to do that are fun and cool. So. What's next? The next is um, the LSST, as far as the next granddaddy mega sky survey. It stands for Large Synoptic um, Survey Telescope. And if I had the, the right picture, there's always, if, uh, astronomers always show us impressive pictures. It's re just a really big piece of glass. It's a giant um, mirror. And they just keep getting bigger and bigger. It's some kind of Moore's law for mirrors. <laughs> and, and so they're increasing exponentially in size. And this is part of why we have a Moore's law in data set sizes. OK, um, and I'm a member of that. The, that's um, equivalent in scale as far as how much it costs to build to you know, the world's biggest uh, science projects. It's, whatever, oh, more than a billion dollars. It's, um, <clears throat> so it's not going to be done for a while. So um, in the moment, they're just sort of, they're still in the design and development. It hasn't even, construction hasn't started. And so who knows when it'll be done, 2018 or something. OK, um, but I'm part of this. Uh, there's an advisory. They realize now, every, with every survey, um, as the data gets bigger, the, real, the importance of statistics and machine learning and um, algorithms is, becomes clearer and clearer. And so for this one, they actually have a committee advising on uh, these issues. And I'm the only non-astronomer on that committee. So um, <clears throat> and you know, I sort of uh, give talks at, at all of these meetings and so on. And if you missed it, we had a workshop on machine learning in astronomy at uh, the last, or two Ijkais ago. And then um, co-writing a book on all this stuff. OK, so <clears throat> what are the kinds of problems that you have in astronomy that boil down to machine learning style statistics problems? Here are seven of them. So um, there are all these different types of objects in the universe. And 
you get this big soup of about half a billion objects right now. With LSST, it will become that what LSST, its main purpose in life is to do something like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, i.e. a massive survey of a huge part of the sky, almost the whole sky, um, <clears throat> but every week. So it's a, it will make a movie of the universe because it turns out that um, if you look right there, you'll see an object today, but tomorrow it might be gone because it'll flash out and then it'll come back again the next day and flash out and come back again. And there are many of these so-called variable objects. And those are some of the least understood things in the universe. But you may have heard of things like pulsars that uh, do that very quickly with high energy. And, and there are many other funny things. And there are things that are so-called transients, like asteroids. And if you've you know, been watching movies and theaters, you know we could all be destroyed by an asteroid. This is of uh, actual interest, making sure we don't get surprised by an asteroid. So, <clears throat> so that's the next thing, is uh, half a billion objects every week. And so we're really talking uh, large scale. Okay, so a lot of the issue, but not all of it, is in astrostatistics uh, is how do you do just even normal machine learning things on a large scale? Okay, uh, so these first four things actually all have to do with just how do you do regular machine learning things on a large scale? So object detection, we, we got all these different types of objects and many of them we know, most of them we sort of know about, or astronomers know about. Well, they're stars, they're galaxies, they're different subtypes of galaxies and they're a, a handful of other funny objects. And one of those types of funny objects, uh, not a handful actually, there are many of them, but one of the most important types that people are, are interested in astronomy is quasars. Okay, what the heck is a quasar? Quasar is a, is a, is a, um, uh, they're very early objects, so they are, the brightest objects that you can see in the sky. And that means, so, um, that means that they're, they can be very, very far away, but they're orders of magnitude brighter than other types of objects. That means energetic. So they're extremely bright um, <coughs> and thus far away and thus old. Far away and old are the same thing in astronomy. Okay, so, uh, because it all has to do with how long light takes to get to you. Okay, so um, what's so cool about that? Well, they're the oldest objects as, then that you can see in the universe. The oldest. So in other words, you're seeing way back to the beginning of time, as far back in time as we can see. All right, so um, that's of interest because if we can get a catalog of all of these really old objects, then we're sort of getting a map of the distribution of matter in the very early universe, the earliest that we can see. And as you can imagine, if we had that, we could do all sorts of analyses and conclusions. Compare that to where we see matter in the nearby universe or, or nearby in time universe. And then infer things about the process that led from old to new. Okay, so quasars is super important. So, we have half a billion objects. A few of them are labeled. There aren't that many astronomers and <laughs> we don't pay them enough to uh, go and label a half a billion objects. So we need some way to go and detect which of those things are quasars. And you know, it wasn't that long ago that you would publish a whole paper in astronomy on one quasar. <laughs> one interesting object especially if it's very far away. Those are uh, so-called high redshift quasars. So redshift is how we um, talk about distance. Okay, so leads to our next topic, which is, um, well, okay, I've taken a snapshot of the whole sky, but really I just have x, y, 
locations of the objects. I don't really know how, the z, I don't know how far away they are. Okay, but I can uh, get a pretty good, I can infer how far the w away they are by looking at the redshift, which if you remember in your distant physics class, um, maybe, you remember the idea of Doppler effect? So you take that idea and you can, by looking at um, brightness in different bands or spectra, you can determine uh, the redshift and thus get something that's correlated with the distance. Okay, so redshift is, if you can get the redshift of an object, which you get by looking at its um, brightness in different wavelengths, then you have an estimate of its distance. So what you want is for every object, not only its x and y, but also its distance. Okay, <clears throat> the problem is that um, we measure all of these objects, these half a billion objects, with maybe four different wavelengths. Cheap, you know, it's cheap to do. We, you can think of it as a camera with four different filters. Okay, um, but then when we get for a much smaller subset of them, we can take a more expensive measurement and get many wavelengths or a more complete spectrum. And for that, with that, we can get a good estimate of the redshift. So it becomes a regression problem. Given a small training sample where we have this, the full spectrum and, and a supervised redshift, now use that to make a guess for the redshift for all of the objects. Okay, so that's that's of huge interest, and um, that has a bunch of issues with it. So the third thing is, um, which I, I sort of uh, hinted at, which if you have a half billion objects, yeah, you might know most of them, but you might get uh, famous by identifying some funny new type of object. It's not a pulsar, it's not a quasar, it's a grazar, because I found it, or whatever. <laughs> so um, there's the idea of finding funny stuff or outliers, okay, in some multidimensional space. The fourth thing I'll come to a little later, that's comparing two data sets. I'll tell you why that's important. Okay, and then the last three things are sort of cross-cutting statistical issues, um, which I'll come back to at the very end. All right, the main, but the main kind of blockage still right now in astronomy is how do we even do regular stuff on a large scale? So um, the first thing, well that you can just, we need to formulate all these things as statistical problems. The first thing is just classification. Well, not necessarily, but um, a, a decent way to go about it is classification. You just go, well, let's do quasar versus non-quasar. There might be a better way to do that. You can imagine other ways, and we can discuss that if you want. But a simple way that works pretty well for now is classification. Estimating the redshift or distance of each object, uh, well, regression. Okay, but um, actually, there are reasons why you can get a uh, multimodal distribution on the distance. In other words, you don't just want a best guess necessarily at the distance or redshift. Maybe you want the full distribution. And so it's not discussed enough, in my opinion, but there's another task machine learning, standard machine learning or statistical task, conditional density estimation, which is sort of uber regression, estimate the whole distribution of y, not just y, best guess at y. And that's actually, I think, the best way to formulate redshift estimation. Okay, and then just finding funny stuff, well, you can imagine doing that in all sorts of ways. One is to um, just do various multi-dimensional queries on the data. This is more or less what's done today. Um, you can imagine 
make things in two, into 2D with PCA or manifold learning or something and looking at, staring at that plot and then going, ah, that looks like an outlier in the 40-dimensional space. Um, let me investigate and turn the telescope to that object and take a look at it. Um, and then, of course, uh, making outlier detection rigorous, you might um, do a density estimate in that space and look for low density points. And you might try to find clusters and look for small, rare clusters. OK, um, the fourth one is actually not as, doesn't come up as much in sort of standard machine learning or other fields. But um, that would be uh, two sample testing and matching between points. So who knows what two sample testing is? So um, here's a problem a multivariate statistics problem. I have a set of points here. I have a set of points here. Did they come from the same distribution? So um, you can imagine how you would use that in astrophysics. You would say, for example, here's a set of points, which is the real sky. Here's a set of points, which is a fake sky that comes from a simulation of physics that's based on our best model of physics, Big Bang Theory plus um, general relativity. If our best, the points, the fake points, don't appear to come from the same distribution as the real points, then probably my model of physics is wrong. So you can never validate. You should hopefully learn that somewhere. I don't know if we teach that very well in American <laughs> science education, but you can never validate actually any theory in science. You can only invalidate theories. So. They should actually, um, you know, at least pass this some kind of hypothesis test that says, yeah, they look like they came from the same distribution. If not, your theory is wrong. Okay, so that's um, for that's why people use or to do this, people use these things called endpoint correlation functions, and that was the thing that led to this dark energy result. The other huge thing that needs to be done in astronomy, which is a frontier, uh, it, it's a, everywhere at the frontier of astronomy is, well, I've got all these different instruments. Actually, I don't know how many instruments there are currently active right now, but you know, tens, certainly, major instruments. And they're all looking at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, and they capture different astrophysical information. So. This instrument could be looking at this patch of sky, and this instrument could be looking at this patch of sky in different wavelengths, like infrared and optical, or whatever. And if I could, um, if I could, so this instrument produces a picture with this set of dots. This instrument produces this picture with this set of dots. Let's make a correspondence between them so that I know. Uh, so I can get a set of dots that has both sets of features. And that will allow me to do more powerful analyses. Okay? But just doing that correspondence, it's some kind of matching problem. And you know, with that's well studied computer science, and that is in some spatial space as well as um, uh, frequency space. So maybe it's a Euclidean matching problem. But then we have uncertainties in the measurements, which we'll get to. So there's noise in where these objects are in these images. So there are specific interesting problems that have to do with this so-called cross-matching. And of course, this is expensive. This is in cubed in the worst case to find the correspondence between two point sets. OK? So. <clears throat> Those are all big problems. These first four things are the main things I'll talk about in, the, in this talk, how to make these things scalable. And then these last three things I'll come to at the very end, which are statistical issues of statistical formulation that really it's not clear yet how to do them. Um, I'll come to them later. Any questions so far? That's actually. Most of what I'll say about astronomy. 
Okay, the rest, uh, I'm going to talk about how you do. See, basically, we've taken these astro problems and we've changed them into machine learning or multivariate statistics problems. And now the main issue I'm going to deal with is how we make these things scalable. All right, so um, any questions about the astronomy part? Okay, so, <clears throat> so this is really just general, uh, a general problem that we, um, that we have. So let's go through these. I've made seven categories. This is kind of arbitrary, and they're, of course, this is, of course, not a complete list by any means. But this is a list of things that I want to give to, um, well, everybody, but let's say astronomers, at least, to be able, as a toolbox, to let them do uh, science with. Okay, these are more or less state-of-the-art textbook methods. Okay, some of them sound a little old and dowdy, but they're still the most reliable way to do certain problems. I'll claim, and I would like to have an argument about these things. But um, your favorite method may not be here. <laughs> Feel free to argue about it. But this is sort of, I claim, 80% of what everybody uh, does in reality or would like to do. All right, or at least if you had these, you'd be pretty happy. They're fancier methods, of course, from the uh, millions of papers that come out every year at ICML and NIPS and so on. But, uh, and they're often better, but they're often um, not by much and too expensive and so on. So I'd at least like to give them these things, scalable, in a scalable form. All right, so um, you know, one thing you want to do when you first get a data set is you want to do simple queries on it. I only find all the objects with um, such and such magnitude greater than 7.3. That would be a range search. Or here's an object. Find me the k nearest objects, k closest objects to it. That's the nearest neighbor search. And then one thing that will come up a lot is for every object, find its k nearest neighbors. I call that all nearest neighbors. And that's n squared. So naively, finding the k nearest neighbors order n, because I have to compute the distances to every object. All nearest neighbors is n squared. We are talking about millions. Um, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, and billions of objects. So n, order n, is pretty much the limit of what we can, we can tolerate. So this is the kind of main problem in real astronomy, cutting edge astronomy. n squared, don't even think about it. That's way beyond the time it takes to go get a cup of coffee. And so uh, if it takes 24 hours or more, Nobody, nobody can wait that long. Okay, so um, <clears throat> you're completely screwed unless it's n log n, maybe, is a little worse than n, maybe tolerable. Certainly not n squared. All right, maybe I want to estimate a density. If I want to do that non-parametrically or with high accuracy, then your most reliable method right now is kernel density estimation. And then if you want to do the conditional version of that, that would be kernel conditional density estimation. Yes, an old method that's not in fashion, but still the best thing you have for reliable predictions. Classification. There are many, of course, many, many more methods than what I'm showing here. But if you want the best accuracy, generally it's a support vector machine, a nonlinear support vector machine. And but one thing I like and push is something that's also old fashioned, but just a hair less accurate, it turns out, than a nonlinear support vector machine, which is a kernel discriminant analysis, which doesn't even, um, it's so old, nobody talks about it anymore. But it's actually, even naively, a lot more efficient than a support vector machine and very close in accuracy. And of course, Fancier support vector machines, we would love to be able to do. Regression, well, your most accurate 
regression method is probably Gaussian process regression, but that's n cubed. Um, again, just a hair less accurate is kernel regression, which nobody really talks about anymore. Dimension reduction. So um, we go back in time. We have PCA. We have a whole bunch of similar linear dimension reduction methods. Um, those are sometimes bad enough to compute, but then if we want to do the fancy nonlinear stuff, not um, manifold learning type stuff, that's generally n cubed. Clustering, well, we have our, our old standbys like k-means and mixture of Gaussians, but if you want to be somehow non-parametric in your clustering, we have things like mean shift, which, um, uh, and we have things like, um, still old, but quite powerful still, hierarchical clustering, worst case n cubed. They call that friends of friends in astronomy. And then you have these other things that we don't tend to think about as much in machine learning, which are um, spatial statistics that you can use to do two sample testing. Are these two data sets, do they come from the same distribution or not? Okay, um, and then and the accuracy of those, well, there's a two, so-called two-point statistic, which has to do, the way you compute it is by looking at all pairs of points. There's a three-point statistic, which is counting all triplets of points that lie within some distance constraint. That's n cubed. You want to be even more accurate, you look at quadruplets, and that's n to the four, and so on. So this is almost unlimited in computational pain. If you're looking for pain, go to the endpoint correlation functions. And then this cross-matching business n cubed. Okay, and that's even a simple version of the problem that doesn't deal with uncertainties and so on. Okay, so this is my incomplete list of all of multivariate statistics, in a way. The sort of workhorses that I would like to give to astronomers and other scientists. I want to scale all these things up. This is my lab's to-do list. Needless to say, this as is with these n squareds and up, you see a lot of n squareds in the state of the art things and n cubes, and that's not gonna work. So that's the main problem. Okay, so, but there's good news. If you simply, um, when I said nearest neighbor is order n, you should have gone, no, no, there's a fast algorithm for nearest neighbors. It's not actually order n if you use the best known algorithm. And that's true of many of these things. So uh, just a quick scan of this list and you don't see any more n squareds and n cubes, but uh, there's some caveats. So um, where I don't have any stars, asterisks, that is a runtime that's proven, a worst case runtime, proven in a way that I find satisfactory. <laughs> um, <clears throat> star means that you can observe that runtime empirically roughly, and so that's, I'm pretty confident that that's the runtime, but it's not proven. That is still important to prove it. Two stars means I'm pretty sure there's an algorithm that we know how to do that can achieve that runtime. <laughs> well, we haven't even made the algorithm yet, so it's a conjecture. Three stars means under certain, the algorithm doesn't exist, uh, at least in practice, but there's a wild conject, wilder conjecture that, that could, there could be an algorithm that achieves that runtime. <laughs> okay, and you see the three stars are on these toughest, some of these things that I still consider very open problems. Nonlinear support vector machines, Gaussian process regression, and manifold learning type things. Kernel PCA is very related to GP regression, and so on. So those are still basically open and, and very slow in practice. And those are some of the things we're working on the, the most fervor right now. Okay, but for many of these other things, it's sort of good news. We have pretty fast algorithms. Now, when I say fast algorithms, there are hundreds of papers that you'll find, KDD and all over the place. 
for all these different kinds of problems. And some of them, to me, don't count. Most of them don't count because it doesn't, it's not a fast algorithm if it doesn't compute the right thing. <laughs> I can always produce a fast algorithm if you don't put any constraints on how accurate my result has to be. Okay, so um, it must have some kind of accuracy guarantee of some kind or else I don't know what it's doing and it doesn't count. And of course, we know those of you with computer science backgrounds know, should know, there's fast theoretical runtime and there's fast real runtime. How long it takes me, how much time I have to go waste getting coffee, that's what I mean really by runtime. Real CPU runtime. And that's my number one desideratum. And then of course we try to prove theoretical worst case runtimes when we can. Okay, and you could also ask about other resources besides time and so on and other um, constraints. In reality, most algorithms papers are talking about the default setting, which is everything fits in RAM and you only have one machine. Eh, one billion objects may not fit in RAM, <laughs> probably does not fit in RAM. So. Um, we have to start thinking about more realistic, other realistic scenarios for big data. Like, it, if it's on disk but not RAM, and maybe you want to suck in bits into RAM at a time and process uh, that way. Or, and much of what we're talking about in this summer school is online learning. That's another approach which I'll mention, which is, hmm, maybe I can get away with just doing a few scans over the data. Or I might not even have to touch all of the data and I might get a um, pretty good answer. Okay, Leon Botu, I think, will probably talk all about that tomorrow. But that's just one of my seven tricks, other tricks. So, um, <clears throat> and then, of course, there's no such thing as a serial computer anymore. Every computer is now many machines. Eventually my cell phone will be multi-core and so on. So, but there are two kinds of distributed computing. There's like multi-core where you've got the same RAM shared by all the computers. And then there's the kind where there are different boxes and they all have their own RAMs. Okay, that's the supercomputer regime or what used to be called supercomputers. Okay, so we have to actually think about all of these settings and we're going to talk about real big data analysis. This is my personal score sheet for my lab, my work, which is we're always trying to get the fastest algorithms, fastest overall algorithms. Light green means we feel we have the fastest algorithm overall. Darker green means we're fast in some settings and um, neck and neck maybe on some challenge problems with other methods. Okay, so we work in all these different areas. Now, if you're nuts like me and you want to speed up the whole machine learning textbook, what do you have to do? Well, there are many different types of computational problems actually. There isn't just one. Um, and so, I don't know if you guys know what the National Academies do. National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Medicine, they their purpose is to give out prizes, in a way, um, elect people to the National Academies. But also, they write reports on topics of national interest. This whole big data thing is now a topic of national interest. And so uh, I was a part of a committee, the committee that was chosen to do this. And um, one of the things we did was identify what are the common computational bottlenecks that are underneath all of data analysis. And we identified seven types. One is sort of what I call basic statistics. Um, means, variances, medians, covariances, whatever. Then there's a second type which I focus on a lot, which is, and it, the, the category name is something I made up. It's any problem that has to do, in the end, with distances and 
similarities between objects like kernels or, or other similarity functions. And these generally tend to boil down to some kind of computational geometry type problem. The third thing is, any, is graphs. Yeah. Well, there are types of um, there are types of applied math problems. It's just a type. It's it's just a I pulled it out because it's a little simpler in some ways than the other problems. That doesn't mean it's solved, right? Because uh, there there's a ton of people working on even those problems because uh, they just are looking at harder and harder settings. Like a lot of the sparse sparsity community is looking at things like how do you um, estimate even things like medians with a very limited buffer, so in the streaming setting and so on. So it, there, there are just different types of mathematical problems. Okay, graphs, you know, there's a whole you learned all about graphs, hopefully, in, in some class in computer science. Linear algebra, the whole world of people who just think about linear algebra problems all day. So, so that's what I mean by there are just many sub-worlds within this. Optimizations, a lot of what we're talking about in the summer school uh, this year is optimizations. And it's a lot of the focus of the last five to ten years of machine learning. Okay, again, its own world. Integrations. If you're a Bayesian, this is your, the main world of pain that you live in is you want to do high dimensional integrals. I'm not going to talk about that today because that um, is its own thing. And then the seventh thing is basically anything that boils down to dynamic programming and matching, okay, which comes up a lot in computational biology matching sequences and so on. All right, but this is just to give you a feeling for the range of things you have to think about across machine learning, the, the range of fundamental applied math type problems. In a way, you can't get away, I think, being a machine learning researcher without knowing at least a little bit about all of these things, because they will come up. You can't really know nothing about linear algebra. You can't know nothing about optimization and so on. And I, eventually, you'll have to know something about all of these things, computationally, because it will impact your life. OK, which ones are the, how important are these things, in a way, at least relative to my um, little to-do list? Well, I've color-coded the various bits, different methods by sort of what is the main concern, what is the main bottleneck in that method? What type of problem are we dealing with? And you see a lot of this is red. So red is this thing that I called n-body. It's geometric type problems, things to do with distances. And that's a, lot of, uh, that's a lot of the methods. A lot of them are also greens and, and blues, linear algebra and optimization, which are very related. Linear algebra to me really is just optimization under a certain, um, in a way, nicer settings, it's convex and so on. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, and I work, I've worked uh, most in the reds because that's been uh, where a lot of the bang has been, at least in astronomy. And I also work in the, in linear algebra and optimization. Okay, but you see the other ones here and there as well in my list. But depending on what your world you live in, if you live in the world of uh, non-parametric bays or whatever your main concern is MCMC and, and integrations and so on. But this is my list. <coughs> okay, so here's the main thing I want to talk about. I'll go through these. I don't have that much time. I'll go through them kind of quickly. Seven general strategies. These are sort of cross-cutting across many of these types of problems and many different types of machine learning methods. Okay, um, <clears throat> the first one is divide and conquer, which 
uh, he learned was, should have learned is, and I claim, the most powerful single algorithmic strategy in the world of algorithms, divide and conquer. Break up the problem into many bits, solve them independently, and then merge the solutions. Okay, um, databases are built on this basic idea and, and all sorts of things. So more or less that translates in our world here, machine learning, to trees. So I'll talk about trees. Then there's the idea of function transforms. You've got some hard function, you change it to some other function. And the most common way to do that all across applied math is to do some kind of series expansion. Represent that in terms of some basis of simpler functions. The third trick is sampling. This is one of the most powerful tricks. And I list these roughly in order. These are in order of some, in some funny space, which is things you should think about first, <laughs> and then next, and so on. Sampling. You see, once you, I'll give you a bit of the punchline. Once you've tried these other th things, um, they often lead to problems in high dimensions. Sampling is something that's insensitive to dimension, even insensitive to the number of points um, in many cases. So it's very powerful, and you can combine it with these other previous tricks to get the best results. Okay? Sampling is Monte Carlo, and we sometimes reinvent Monte Carlo under other names, um, random projections, and, and whatever. But, um, it's Monte Carlo. Locality. This, is, uh, this gets into blood and guts, dirty system stuff. We all have math backgrounds, or at least math leanings. We don't like dirty stuff like L1 cache in your processor, and disk cache. And, um, but if you talk to people who build systems, they're very aware that Disk access is whatever, one, two, three, four orders of magnitude slower than RAM access. And so um, that becomes hard to ignore when you start to deal with big data. And then if you have distributed computing, many computers trying to do stuff all at the same time, they might need to communicate. And then there's network delays. So you can think of that as another mem level of the memory hierarchy that takes even longer than sucking things off your own disk you got to get stuff from another machine over the internet or, or whatever. <clears throat> so you basically, once you start thinking about that, you have to reorganize your computation so that you do certain things locally. In other words, within the cheap memory. OK, um, streaming or online, which if your data happens to come in in a stream, stream means I get in a data point, maybe I can't even store it. Maybe I have, I have so much data that I have to get rid of some data, throw it away. So this is the case, for example, in the Large Hadron Collider, which is another th project that I work on. They contacted me a few years ago. Everybody know what the Large Hadron Collider is? It's the biggest uh, particle accelerator in history. It's running now. It's one million particle events per second continuously for 15 years. So it's so much data, that's a true fire hose of data that um, they can't store it all even. Okay, so that's a real streaming situation. But you can, it also turns out to be profitable to fake a streaming situation um, and just go, well, maybe I can store it all, but I still wanna go through it as a stream because I might be able to do online learning and not uh, actually even touch all the data. I might have a great model by the time I've 10% through the data. Okay, um, <clears throat> and then, of course, parallelism. Now, and that's clusters and GPUs. Everyone know what GPUs are? That's this new thing. It used to be just for video games, making your video games work faster. But now it's a general purpose coprocessor that's like a mini supercomputer. It has parallelism in it. And if you go through the pain of learning how to program it, you essentially get a little supercomputer that you can work with. Okay. Um, <clears throat> notice that I put parallelism as number six. It's near the end of my list. You should always do 
smart algorithms first before you rely on brute force. Brute force is great, but um, it's painful, it's expensive, it's painful to program still, and expensive and kludgy. It's great. If you're going to have it anyway, you can't ignore it. Like I said, there's no more, there's no such thing as a serial computer anymore. But you might as well do the smartest algorithm you can do in parallel. So this is a translation. Hadoop is not the answer to everything because Hadoop is the stupidest algorithm done in parallel. Number seven. If you can't solve the problem with intelligence and um, fair and square, then you cheat. You change the problem into some other problem. And there are various instances of that. OK, I don't have much time, but I will jump through these things. Trees, various kinds of trees. I'll show you pictures. Here's a tree, KD tree. Simple enough, you chop up space, kind of like you do with a decision tree, one variable at a time. Here's all of the data, 2D, this is the top of the tree. You find a way to split along one variable. Somehow you get two children, you split each of those across the other dimension, so on. You keep doing that, and then kaboom, it, here's that level six. Now, KD tree seems like a dumb, primitive idea, and it kind of is. It's from 1970, after all. But amazingly, it's not as dumb as it seems. It's still, for many problems, even high dimensional problems, where you would think, no, this, this is too dumb to work in high dimensions, one variable at a time. You know, it's hard to say what the best tree is. Sometimes it's still KD trees. 800 dimensions, still the fastest thing. And here's one hint as to why. These bounding boxes that um, this <coughs> describe the little subsets, they don't fill up the whole space, right? It's not a grid. It's not a hierarchical grid. These bounding boxes shrink wrap the data. And so um, the general wisdom that trees don't work well in high dimensions is not true. They don't work in high intrinsic dimension, which is the true dimension of the manifold that data live on. And that may be high, in which case you're screwed with trees and basically anything else. Okay, but it, it's that dimension that's your worry, not the actual number of columns in your data. Thousands of dimensions, a KD tree might still be fine. Here's another thing that's recent that I got excited about, cover trees. Do they work better than KD trees? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's, it's a slightly different concept. You make balls instead of boxes. And the key thing is you make it so that the balls at one level uh, are no more than half the size of the radius of the ball at the previous level. And thus, you, may, you don't need to limit yourself to two balls if you're going to meet that constraint. As, or two children. It might be 50 children. Um, and the reason to have this constraint is it allows you to prove theorems. And it was the first about runtimes. And it was the first kind of tree where you could prove theorems about runtimes. And it was still about as practical as KD trees. OK? So I like them a lot. They don't solve everything. they sometimes not as good as KD trees, but sometimes better. Um, I hope nobody's reviewing this paper. But we have a paper under review on max margin trees, which are just like they sound. And we claim they're better for many problems. So um, I just want to tell you that I claim the fastest algorithms for many problems are based on trees. And I'm not stuck on trees. We try all kinds of things. I don't care how we do, uh, how we get speed ups. It just so happens, and I make my students program. We implement everything. Just for nearest neighbor, we implemented 45 different methods from all over the literature, and databases, and pattern recognition, and whatever. We tried everything, locality sensitive hashing, and uh, all these things you might have heard of. Um, all sorts of things you haven't heard of. 
Um, it's trees. So you want to do spherical or orthogonal rain search or nearest neighbor. Uh, it's still Bentley's original algorithm from 1970 with different kinds of trees. Mixture of Gaussians, k-means, trees. All nearest neighbors. That's an n squared thing, by the way. We've shown that you can do that in order n. So this is a proof. So one punchline I want you to take away from this talk is there are no more n squared problems, almost. We can basically do any n squared problem using two trees uh, in order n time and prove it. OK. Um, Nearest neighbor classification is slightly easier than finding the actual nearest neighbors. Endpoint correlation functions, which are these two sample testing statistics, kernel discriminant analysis, mean shift, hierarchical clustering. Here's an example. 75 million points um, would naively take 150 years. Uh, this is a three-point correlation, which is naively n cubed with our algorithm, 55 seconds, exact, no approximation. Okay, n cubed turns into n to the log three. Yeah? Low dimensions. This is low dimension. Three. This is real um, three-dimensional objects, or objects in three-dimensional space. Yeah. So that's an example. So this is my counter example to Hadoop. Show me, um, how, I don't know how many orders of magnitude this is, but show me that kind of speed up with uh, a stupid algorithm on even 10,000 computers. The right thing is if you're, if you're going to use parallelism, you should do a smart algorithm in parallel. OK, and we have a fancier version. Now. When you get to things like sums of Gaussians, which comes up a lot, it comes up in old, there are two kinds of kernel methods. There are the old kernel estimators, which I claim are still pretty darn useful. And then there's the newfangled kernel methods, which have been very powerful. And that's what you want to do with support vector machines. You want to use a kernel. And you can think of Gaussian process regression as a kernelized thing. Um, we have many masters of Alex Mola's in the back, the master himself. So um, people are now turning to things, this kind of idea. And I'm talking about the idea by Rahimi, 2008, where you, use, you represent the kernel as some kind of, um, uh, some of Fourier, some kind of Fourier space. And uh, we have a thing on that. Um, and then sampling, as I mentioned, doing it inside trees is a very profitable strategy. We should, one of my hobby horses is to show that, kind of like Hadoop, there's simple sampling, which, um, for example, in linear algebra, for those of you who don't know, there's been this trend in linear algebra, which is to do linear algebra by sampling. You just sample, subsample the rows or the columns or both, but let's say it's just the rows. You just take a random sample almost random sample, you, 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 um, you basically do important sampling by the length squared of the vectors. And then you do your computation like SVD just on those vectors. So it's almost really naive sampling. OK, but they prove a lot of theorems about it. Um, now, you can, these trees, I don't care what kind of tree it is, but it's some kind of essentially a hierarchical grouping of data. And recognizing that these things are Monte Carlo. For Monte Carlo, there's a book from 1952 or so that um, points out there's a simple strategy called stratified sampling, which just says if you can break up your problem, your sampling problem, into groups, then you can. Uh, more profitably sample, you can sample with less, achieve the same error and less, fewer samples. Okay, so a tree is a sort of a natural for that. And we beat these, um, these uh, simple sampling methods in linear algebra problems. And we do the same thing, of course, in kernel type problems. 
How, how much uh, overtime do I get, Vichy? <laughs> Five minutes? <laughs> okay. So here's one of my hobby horses. Nearest neighbor. Good old nearest neighbor comes up all over the place. Even if it's an ancient method for, say, classification, if you want to do something new and fancy like manifold learning, ah, you got to compute nearest neighbors again. In fact, for every point, you got to find its neighbors. So that's all nearest neighbors in squared. So, for, but the problem is high dimension. So trees break down in some high intrinsic dimension. So um, something called locality sensitive hashing was suggested, which is based on the idea that if you just subsample the dimensions, the dimensions, and then compute distances in that subsample of the dimensions, there's some theorem that says, with high probability, they're similar to the original distances in the high dimensions. And then you can do a simple method based on that. And fine. Uh, that's called locality sensitive hashing. And the, so what do you do as a computer scientist or whomever when faced with a, a known hard problem, which is, say, <coughs> nearest neighbor in high dimensions? You make a sense of approximation, and then you solve the relaxed problem. OK, so one thing that sounds reasonable is, well, OK, I, I won't return to the real nearest neighbor. I'll return to a point which is within a factor of 1 plus epsilon times the distance of the true nearest neighbor. OK, so it's close in distance. That seems OK at first glance. You're like, oh, that's, that's pretty reasonable. The problem is the curse of dimensionality, which refers to many things these days, confusingly. But to me, the real curse of dimensionality refers to a theorem in 1950, which says that the distribution of pairwise distances in a random sample, as the dimension goes up, converges to a Gaussian. It's asymptotically normal around a certain mean and a certain variance which shrinks with dimension. In other words, all of the distances become numerically very close to each other in high dimensions. The numbers, which are the distances between things, be approach the same number. OK, so um, that sounds bad. That sounds like, oh, the, the distances are meaningless in high dimensions. No, their number, the actual numbers, become close. But they're still an ordering. So, and which still makes sense, okay? But what this says is if I guarantee that I'm gonna return a, a point that's within a certain factor of the true nearest neighbor's distance, that could be any point in high dimensions because the distances become similar, you see? So one plus epsilon approximation is a bankrupt concept <laughs> to me. You want to approximate in terms of rank. In other words, preserve. If I'm, I will guarantee you that I give you something within the first 1% of uh, the ordering of distances. OK? So this was the first algorithm two NIPSes ago that, uh, that does that. And it's more accurate than distance approximation. OK, you can do trees on disk. You get similar speed ups. Online learning, we hear all about. The masters themselves are here talking about online learning. Uh, we have some things that we work on. Parallelism, I'll just mention one thing. Um, it's a lot of work, but you can do these trees in parallel. But for optimization problems, um, we have a master of optimization at Georgia Tech called Nemirovsky. And I posed the question to him, um, how do you use many computers? Now that we're in the world of many computers, how do you use many computers to make optimization fundamentally faster? In other words, the convergence rate is faster. Now, the usual way is, ah, there's linear algebra inside, um, you know, something like a Newton's method. And so you speed up the linear algebra with parallelism. In other words, you speed up the, each step. But you can't do fewer steps. Parallelism doesn't let you do it in fewer steps. Okay, Then you can ask for online optimization. 
how do you, which seems inherently sequential, how does many computers help you? Can it help you? And so this is sort of a, a little hot topic right now, and I think it's very important. And uh, we have a thing that I can talk to you about if you want. I think we've shown one of the first, if not the first result that uh, is a theorem that says you can get speed up. Okay, um, <clears throat> not that Nemorowski is wrong. He's probably right. In, in, uh, I probably just don't understand him. So, um, and then a final trick is to change, change the formulation. In optimization, there are all sorts of ways to change the, we know about dualities and so on, and there are many other relaxations and, and so on that I think we all need to learn as machine learning people. Okay, and then of course the final dirty trick is to don't try to do the original machine learning method. Make up a new method that somehow is as statistically powerful as, uh, as you were trying to get at. Um, for example, trying to do, maybe it's hard to speed up kernel density estimation, but, although we've sped it up, but suppose it is, then um, maybe you want to, really what you want is a non-parametric density estimator that's fast. So maybe change the method so it's fundamentally faster. So we do that kind of thing too. Okay, real quick, last three slides. <clears throat> um, measurement error, so this, is, this comes up a lot in astronomy, astrophysics, uh, because the people who have the data are the same people who built the instruments. So they know a heck of a lot about the instrument. In fact, they're pretty sure they can give you a distribution of the measurement error, the error with which a measurement was made. In other words, the thing says that there's a dot here. Well, there's some Gaussian error on where that dot is, and I can tell you what the parameters of those Gaussian are, Gauss, Gaussians are. Okay, so that's extra information, in other words. In machine learning, we normally just take a bunch of vectors, those are data points, and that's it. We feed them through some method. But you might have extra information, which is, these aren't just points, they're points with some spread that's known. And the spreads might be different for different points, and that you want to account for that. A classic example of astronomy is, I have some points that are really far away, and some that are really close. The ones that are far away, there's a lot of error on exactly where they are, right? I want to include all of these points in the same analysis, but weighted differently according to measurement error. This, is, this problem in statistics is called errors and variables. It's a very interesting problem. It actually comes a lot, up a lot in any science where you have instruments that are understood. Okay, so we're working on uh, how to do kernel estimators with uh, measurement errors. It's a fundamental problem in general dimension. If you're thinking about getting into astronomy, well, at some point it's all going to be about time series because like I said, the LSST is measuring um, the sky every week. And so it's a time series. Every object is now a time series. So um, we are basically going to want to do all these types of things, object detection, redshift estimation, all these types of things, on time series rather than fixed vectors. And so a natural thing to do is to go, OK, fine. Let's just have a kernel um, between time series. Okay, And uh, Alex has some kernels for things like that. And we've done a little extension of some of those things. So that's, that's one approach. And very related to that is something called functional data analysis, which comes from the statistics community, which it turns out is very similar in flavor to current, the idea of using kernels. It's somehow represent your objects as functions and modify your methods to use functions instead of points. Finally, I want to make a push for active learning. So um, it seems to me active learning still hasn't really been formalized very well. 
sequential online learning is pretty well formalized, but not pool-based, where you get to revisit points in deciding whether you're going to use them or not. And so we're working on that. <coughs> we are somewhere along the way, we're trying to come up with the first rigorous framework. Why? Because um, the data, when another strategy for the data being really big is, well, you got to, the training sets are big too. And you don't, you want to, um, I've got an astronomer here who's willing to devote whatever, five hours of time for labeling objects. Um, I want to present to him or her the best, whatever, five hours worth of objects to label, to make a training set. That's one version of the active learning problem, sort of the classic one. But another one is telescopes are actually controlled by computers, of course. And so, um, you know, sometimes there's an actual astronomer sitting in there moving the controls, but often it's computer controlled. And so we can, in principle, not observe the whole sky, just observe uh, the most important bits. Okay. <clears throat> so that's all I wanted to say. Um, here are some general sound bites. Fast algorithms exist. You should use them. Do not use naive algorithms. The difference between n squared and n is really big. High dimension is always a problem. These other things, streaming, disk, especially disk, there's almost no work on disk-based fast algorithms. That is sort of. Um, and Hadoop doesn't solve everything. And one thing that um, Leona, I think, tomorrow will talk about a little bit about, he has some beginnings of, that I really love, on the connection between statistical theory and computational theory. It's a huge universe of results that you guys and girls, guys and gals, um, should be inventing, which is um, we have statistical theory, which says how error goes down with the number of data, roughly. We have computational theory, which says how computational effort goes up with the number of data. But those two have almost no connection. And in reality, you can't think about statistics without thinking about computation. So they must be merged. Okay, that's it. Thanks.